OK, let's get going. Uh, all right, so this week, remember, today's Wednesday, tomorrow's Monday. Right, so we have class again tomorrow. Don't forget about that. Labs for Monday are actually tomorrow as well. If for some reason you can't go because you've got some other prior commitment that didn't get canceled because the class has changed, uh, you should probably go to a different lab, but it might be too late. Email me if you can't make it, and um, we'll, we'll chat. It's not, not a huge big deal. Okay, for those of you who start, did this week's lab, I didn't think it was too bad. Anybody have any real concerns with it? No, it's on cues. We, we do go over the pre-lab, goes over two kind of important C++ things you may not have seen before. One is called the const uh, uh, keyword, which basically means whatever follows const, you can't change it. That's really all it means. And in C++, it's, it's made for you, the programmer, to say, hey, compiler, make sure I don't change something that I said I wouldn't. Right? That's about it. It doesn't do anything else. And then the other thing are these things called, uh, they're called pass by reference, which basically means if you're passing a variable to a function, normally you get a copy of that variable. And sometimes that doesn't work very well, especially if you're trying to pass a, an object that doesn't copy correctly. We'll talk about those things a little later in the course. Um, but if you want, you can pass by what's called reference, which means you're basically saying, OK, function, you get to use the original variable. OK, so we talk about those in the pre-lab. And then the lab itself is on queues. And it wasn't too, too bad, I hope. All right. Uh, let's see. We're in the midst of homework three. How's that going? Going all right? Don't raise your hand. But if you haven't started it yet, <laughs> then it's way too late, right? It's due Sunday. And it was originally due today, right? So it's due Sunday. And you should be well on your way to, uh, to doing it at this point. OK? All right, questions on logistics. I have put lab two grades up. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to do lab two, email me and explain yourself. <laughs> OK, I'll probably give you a chance to do it on your own. But you should be doing the labs, even if they're not having lab class because of crazy things like snow. OK, questions? All right, today we're going to go through two things. I wanted to do this last week, but we're going to do it today. Uh, for those of you who took Comp 11, I know you did a lot on recursion. So this hopefully will be mostly review. We will blast through some of the recursion stuff. But I understand, and because I went through this when I was learning programming type classes, when I was taking programming classes, recursion takes a little bit of time to like sink in. Okay, And some of you guys might be like, I got it. Right? And, and no worries on recursion. But sometimes it takes a, little, uh, it takes a few times to sink in before you, uh, like before you really kind of go, oh, I kind of get what's going on. So we'll do a little review on this. After this, we will go into the next uh, data structure, which is called the tree, which is kind of fun. Did you talk about trees at all in Comp 11? No? OK, that's going to be brand new stuff. Good. Trees are really neat. So I think you'll, I think you'll enjoy that. All right, so recursion. This is my favorite example of recursion. You ever go into a bathroom with two mirrors, one on side of the, or anywhere with two mirrors, one behind the other, and you look into it and you can just see like it goes on forever and ever. Like as a kid, you're like, whoa, I wonder, like, where's it end? And it never, even today I do that, but, um, <laughs> right? Because it just whoop, keeps going forever and ever. That's kind of the idea of recursion, this self referential idea. OK? All right, so, and I have lots of little jokes like this in recursion, like throughout this, this thing. Um, OK, quick, we're going to do a quick uh, Clips tip of the day and Unix tip of the day. Uh, anybody sick of renaming G to Clang for using Eclipse? Yeah, follow these directions. I won't show you this right now, but go to the website, grab the recursion lecture, follow this. What you're going to do is make two what's called soft links. You're basically going to say, hey, when I say G++, I want you to run Clang++. Right? And when I say GCC, I want you to run Clang. Now, in this class, we really don't run GCC. But if you do this, then it will actually go, and when Eclipse looks for G++, uh, G++ it'll actually use Clang++. And then you never need to go and change that part when you're setting it up. Don't worry about copying this down now. It's all online. OK? After that, you do have to change your path in Eclipse to say, hey, look in my home folder for the names of the programs. Okay? And what that means is uh, Eclipse is going to say, where's G++? And it's going to first look in your own home folder. And it's going to say, oh, go here for G++. And really, you're going to sneakily tell it to go to Clang++. All right, that's all you have to do. Do those two things, and you'll never have to do that part again. And it'll save you 10 seconds every time you set up your project. Okay? 
All right. This is a big this is a big one. This one I just realized today that we could fix this. Anybody sick of core dumps? Haha. -ha. If you go and run this little program I created, this little script I created, no cores.sh slash comp slash fifteen slash public underscore html slash files slash no cores.sh, it will if all if things go correctly, it will take uh, it will set up your uh, your system so the next time you log in, no more cores. Right? You'll seg fault, but it'll just go aborted and it won't produce a core file, so it won't fill up your directory, right? Which is kind of nice. Right? Um, I did look into, people have asked me before, they go, hey, what are these core files? Can I do anything with them? Like, why does it do that? What it does is it like dumps the memory from your program into your folder, and you can actually run that program with GDB and it will tell you exactly where your program crashed. So that's kind of neat. Right? It like has the ability to recreate what was going on when it crashed and do that. So if you wanted to keep the cores and look, you could do that. But I think it's just as easy to rerun GDB with your uh, program and get an actual like real-time output. But anyway, no more cores if you no more core dumps if you do that. Woohoo. All right. And I'll tell that to the COP11 people too, so they can stop getting core dumps too. All right. Okay, recursion. If you type in recursion into Google, this is what comes out. Did you mean recursion? Right? The reason it says this is because, and, and you ever, ever do that where you type something in and it says, did you really mean this? Because Google's smart enough to tell you. Well, because Google's full of a bunch of nerdy geeks who have a sense of humor, they like to say, hey, by typing in recursion, did you mean recursion? And you type, if you click on it, it just goes back to the same page and says, did you mean recursion? And, We'll do that forever, right? Which is kind of fun, OK? All right. So to understand recursion, you have to understand recursion, right? I mean, the, the whole idea of recursion is this self-referential thing. And I know most of you guys have been through this before if you took another class. Here would be the stupidest recursive program you could ever call, OK? You could, call, you could have this program in main, which is a function. It's the first function you get. If you call main from main, Right? You can do that. And it will actually go back and rerun this, and then call main again, and then rerun this, and call main again. And then eventually, it will give you a core dump. <laughs> right? Because eventually, it will run out of what? Memory. Run out of some particular type of memory. This, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So Jacqueline says it's, it's going to run out of the stack, which is the part in your program that we talked about that, where it stores all of your functions. Right? So you call main, and you call main again, and you call main again, and you keep getting these activation records. Did you do activation records in Comp 11 too? Yeah. You get activation record after activation record, and then eventually your program goes, I'm done. Because there's no base case here or anything else. Okay? So this would be a stupid uh, recursive function, but it would indeed count as a recursive function for what it's worth. Okay? When we talk about recursion, right, we basically say it's this model. To solve a jigsaw puzzle recursively, you could say to yourself, first things first, is the puzzle finished? Right? And if the puzzle's finished, stop putting the puzzle together. Right? Last year I worked on a puzzle, a, a puzzle with my then girlfriend, sad now, sad, but um, worked on a puzzle with my girlfriend and uh, we had one piece left over. And so we were constantly in this loop. Is the final puzzle finished? No, because we couldn't find that last stupid piece until we moved out and it was under the couch. So mm -hmm. anyway, we should have looked there. But anyway, the, if the puzzle's finished, stop. Right? If, if not, find a correct puzzle piece, put it in, and then solve the puzzle again. <laughs> right? Which means, go back up here. Is the puzzle finished? If so, stop. Find a correct. And you see how this is just a recursive way to do something? You're just continuing to do the same thing until you reach this one case where the puzzle's finished. Right? That's all recursion is. What's nice about recursion is that it can make some very, very beautiful programs. Right? Solving a puzzle recursively is uh, inherently, at least as far as I'm concerned, inherently a beautiful solution. Right? Because it's three lines long. And now, all right, there's a, a little bit missing here. <laughs> right? Find the correct puzzle piece and place it. Like that's uh, you know, on its own sort of like not easy. Um, although I've always thought that somebody should just make a little iPhone app to take a picture of your puzzle pieces and then do a lot of processing and figure out where they all go. And then tell you, you know, highlight one piece and say, move it here. Highlight the other piece, move it here. It's an interesting like computer vision sort of problem, but maybe next summer I'll do it. If anybody wants to work on it with me, let me know. All right. Uh, but anyway, that's that's how kind of recursion in general works, right? 
Re recall that the re in recursion, we first check for a base case. Okay? Occasionally, you can do this to the end, but generally, the first thing we do when we get into it, when we have a recursive function, is we say, all right, are we done yet? <laughs> all right? That's the first thing you do. When the problem that we're trying to solve has been solved, we stop. Okay? Sometimes we return a result. Most of the time, in fact. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes you've been doing something recursively and print, print, print or something, and then you just stop. You don't need to return anything. Okay? But we're always trying to work towards that base case. In other words, solve a tiny piece of the problem, right? And then call yourself again, solve another tiny piece, call yourself again, solve another tiny piece until you get to the end when you've, uh, when you've gotten that base case and you're done. That's all there is to recursion. Again, it's a very beautiful kind of idea. Mathematicians love it. Computer scientists in general love it. Some of the first programming languages written, like Fortran, did not have the ability to do recursive functions. And then eventually, when they designed some other languages, they came up and said, maybe we should do this. And it was a big discussion about whether it should be allowed. Some people thought, no, nah, it's a little too complicated, or that would make our stack go out of, you know, out of proportion, all that. And then finally, people did decide, let's do it. And then we now have recursive functions. So, um, so it's not the, it wasn't originally decided to put in into general languages. But of course, C++ does have the ability to use recursion. Okay, All right. I know you've done this one, because I sat in on a Comp 11 lecture where you did this. But how to count down recursively from some number to 0? We check our base case, right? Is n less than 0? If n is, not, is less than 0, we stop, right? We're done. Say the word n, or say n, whatever n is, OK? Or print it, or see out it, or whatever, right? And this works towards the base case, because we've just counted down one, all right? And then uh, count down from n minus 1, which is meaning go back up to the top and do the same exact steps. That's all. OK? Yeah, Nelly. Well, in this case, why is it less than 0? Anybody else want to answer that? Yeah. So you include 0. That just happens to be including 0 in this case. Yeah, yeah, good. All right, anything else? OK. Let's see a little bit of code. Here's how you would count down from 0, one way to do it anyway, using a recursive, recursive function. Right? You pass in the count that you're on. Right? If count is less than 0, return, because we're done. Print out count, the current one, and then count down, which from count minus one, which is just call up here, count down. Boom. Right? Count down 10 would print what? Not a trick question. What would count down 10 actually print out? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and then be done. OK? We check the base case here, and then, uh, and then we uh, we keep going. Now, if we tried countdown with too large a number, same problem with running out of stack space. Right? I'm not sure exactly what that is. Um, you, could, you could probably check it pretty easily. Like just keep increase, like doubling the size of the numbers that you want for this little thing. And then eventually, your program will say, start counting down, and then eventually just go, sag fault. Because <laughs> right? it doesn't work. Okay. All right. What about counting up? This is where, this is where recursion gets a little tricky. Okay. Counting up is not quite so straightforward. Because what's the base case when we're counting up? If I'm counting up to 100, what's the base case? 100. If I'm counting up to 200, what's the base case? 200, right? So isn't it true that we've got this base case which totally depends on what our top number is? Unlike counting down to 0, you always are going to stop at 0. OK, so it gets a little bit tricky in here, right? We can't say if count up is greater than something. Like, there's, there's really, no, if we wanted to keep one parameter here, you can't say if count is greater than some number because that number is going to totally change depending on what you started with, right? So it's not going to work. And this wouldn't work either because count up, count plus one, like you're just going to keep going to who knows where. There's no way in this form to actually count directly up to some number. So we have a couple of different solutions. Okay? We have a couple of different solutions. We could say, let's do this. Let's say what we're counting up to and always pass that along. Right? That's one way to do it. And you could say, OK, count 
and then this is your current count, and then max is where you're heading towards, and you just keep passing max through to your function, and then eventually you've got a base case which says if count is max plus one, and my pointer is not working very well, if count is max plus one, then return. That's your base case now because you've passed along max, right? This is a bit ugly though. It's a little bit uglier if you, all you want to do is count up to some number. Okay, if all you want to do is count up to some number. Okay, you have to have two parameters now, and one just kind of gets passed along, and it's, it's not the best in the world. It is a little bit more functional, because why? What can we do now? We can start from anywhere and end it anywhere. So now we've got a more function, like a better fun count. You know, now it's like count from x to y or whatever. Right? We could do that. So it is a little more functional, but it's not quite as simple as maybe we want to do. Is there a way to make our previous program easier? This one, where we can now print out the other one. You know the answer? Hold on. Don't say it. Here's what I want you to do. Talk to your neighbor briefly and see if you can figure out how to come up with this one. Change one thing in it to make it. Is that what you're going to say? To do it or no? Yeah. OK. Change one thing in this program and make it count up instead of down. Can you do that? Besides the name. That doesn't count. If you don't get it, that's OK. This is like a little more advanced, but it's an interesting one. Okay. I hear it. OK, raise your hand if you think you and your partners have it, or your neighbors have it. A couple people, a couple people. OK, you see who did every hand up first. What do you think? Uh, can you just get rid of int count and replace it with int max? Can you do int? Start from zero until it's no, you can't. That was what we tried here, really, right? We tried this. Can't do that because you don't know where to stop, right? But good, good idea, but you don't know where to stop. In the back, you had it back there. Somebody else who had their hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you, you switched the C out and the count up? OK. This is a key, key idea. So now, what, what you said, what's your name? Jeremy. Jeremy. What Jeremy said was switch these two lines. OK, in fact, I believe I have this in here. Uh, so yeah, here we go. Switch the order here so it doesn't print out until the end. Now, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. And if that doesn't make sense, here's where you got to pay attention. Watch this. If I want to count up to 5, let's make it 4. If I want to count up to 4, I call this function count count up 4, right? And what does count up immediately do after the base case? It calls count up what? 3. Has it printed anything yet? No. Then you get count, oops, count up 3, then you get count up 2, then you get count up 1. We're still going, right? Cuz we're looking for count less than 0. Count up 0. What does count up 0 do? No? Count up 0. Are we less than 0? No. So count up 0 calls? Count up negative 1. And what does count up negative 1 do? Now, count up negative 1 returns. Now, this is the key, key idea here. Count up negative 1 returns to count up 0, because that was where Quick called it. Right? I see the little, oh, I get it. Right? Um, count up zero call or count up one returns to count up zero, but look where count up zero ended. Count up zero ended right here. And it says count up negative one, and then when a function returns, what's the next thing that happens in a function? The next line. So it prints what? Zero. Right? Because count up negative one returned to count up zero, which hasn't yet printed anything, and it finally prints zero. And then it's done. And count up 0 is done because it ends the function. Count up 0 got called by count up 1. And count up 1 was here and then called count up 0 and then now goes here. What's it going to print out? 1. Do you see the pattern? 1, 2, dot, 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 dot. And then it goes all the way up to count up 10, or well, sorry, 4. We're doing 4. 
right? It'll do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then main called count up 4, let's say. And so count up, when count up 4 ends, then we get end, then we end. Okay, this is an interesting way of thinking about what's going on, on the active, in terms of activation records. Yes? Is this tail recursion? Uh, is this tail recursion? Uh, actually, in fact, this is, so you don't need to know what that means, but for what it's worth, yes. Tail recursion basically means the, the previous function does not depend on a return value. Like, that's basically what it means, um, which also means that your comp compiler will probably turn this into a for loop. It knows how to do that. May well, I say probably. Some advanced compilers will do that. Yeah, good question. OK, does everybody get what we, just what we did here? Now, this is, this is sneaky, <laughs> right? It's a little sneaky, but it demonstrates the point of what's happening in recursive functions. OK, the idea that after you call a recursive function, you can still do other stuff, right? But it happens all the way at the end, because everybody else calls functions, and then it returns back again, OK? Remember how recursion is really just a stack-based idea, right? So all of this is really like, uh, first in, last out, sort of, or I should say, yeah, first in, last in, first out. Although I guess semantically it probably matters. But anyway, the idea is that there's, there's, you're doing a bunch of stuff and then getting it all off in the reverse order, basically what happens. Okay? Questions on this one? Yeah? How does the computer track where you are in the function in terms of memory? How does the computer. Recursing in the middle instead of at the end? Yeah, sure. When you call a function, all that happens is the, the compiler says, OK, a function is called, save everything that's going on here. In other words, save the current count and save where I need to come back to. Like, this is the next thing I need to return to. So it says it saves that. That's all it needs to save. Because there's nothing else that needs to be saved. And so that's it. And then when, when, the, next, when the final function returns, it says, where do I return back to? And the compiler has already, already set it up that it needs to go back to this line in the previous invocation. That's all. Okay, it knows where the next line is, and it says I'm going there. Yeah, Dan. Is this the same, exact same amount of work for the computer to do counting up this way versus the way we just described? Yeah, you tell me. This is exactly the same way, right? All we've done is swap two functions, so it doesn't do anything else. Now, in terms of being able to, uh, let me see. To answer you, but now and then more I think about it, this may not be able to do tail recursion quite as easily as the other one, because the last, the last line in the thing might have to be the the recursive call. I'm not 100% sure. But point is that really it's not any more work doing this. It's the same number of, of function calls and so forth. Okay? All right, good. And this is, a this is kind of clever. Okay? Switch those. All right, so there's lots of things we can do recur with recursion. You've talked about a whole bunch of them in, in Comp 11, but let's look at a couple of them, right? We can do the power function. In other words, raising something to a power. Right? B to the n, right, just means what? Multiply b by itself n times, right? b times b times b dot 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 b n, n times, right? That's basically all it means. So that's a very easy to do recursion one. Factorial is a very, sim very easy recursion to do. We'll talk about that in a second. Another one is this Fibonacci sequence. You guys heard of the Fibonacci sequence before? Maybe in math class. If you haven't, that's OK. It's actually kind of clever. We'll go through a couple of those. The power one. Okay? If, you want to take the po if you want to take the power, look at how simple it is in a recursive form. Double power, you pass in the number you're multiplying, and then whatever number you still need to multiply itself by. In other words, we would pass in for, B, for, for 4 cubed, we would pass in 4, comma, 3. Okay? And what it does is it says, OK, if n is less than or equal to 0, right, we're done. <laughs> In other words, you can't, you're not going to have any more um, to go down to. Now, this doesn't work for negative numbers, like negative powers. Right? Negative powers are weird anyway, because you're dividing by uh, the number. So it's a little odd anyway. But uh, the point is, we're going to do this. And we're gonna, this time, we're going to actually return something. We're going to return 1. So if we pass in, right, if we passed in, I don't know, 6 to the 0, what is 6 to the 0? 1, right? OK, and because we pass in 6 to the 0, so this is our base case. If n is less than or equal to 0, 
we're going to return 1. Great. Otherwise, in the else statement, we're going to return b times the power of b to the n, n minus 1. Right? Because isn't 4 cubed is the same as saying 4 times 4 squared, which is the same as saying 4 times 4 times 4 to the 1, right? Which is the same as saying 4 times 4 times 4 times the zero to the 0, right? It's exactly the same thing. So that's why this is pretty, uh, it, which is a very short function. Okay? This part is the part that's, that's interesting. The fact that you're actually returning something every time. You're returning b, which is passed in, times the power of b to the n minus 1. Okay? Would you ever write this? Probably not. Because, again, you're worried about like, stack overflows and things, having too many things going on at once in your stack. So you probably wouldn't want to write this, because this is such an easy one to write non-recursively. Right? You can actually do it non-recursively very easy, that for loop. So you probably wouldn't want to. This is kind of for demonstration purposes only. Okay. All right, the factorial function. So the factorial function is, remember the factorial function, right? You've got b factorial is just b times b minus 1 times b minus 2 dot 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 to down to 1. Right? That's the factorial function. And in this case, recursively, Pretty darn simple. Pass in a number. If it's less than or equal to 1 now, return 1. That 1 factorial is 1. right? Otherwise, you return the number times the factorial of the 1 below it. And that's it. Okay? You have to, sometimes you have to walk yourself through, the, walk through this a couple times to see it. right? Factorial of 3. Are we less than 1? No. We're, so we don't return 1. We return 3 times factorial of 2. Goes up here is two less than one. No, we, so we return the factorial that we turn two times the factorial of one, right? And then when if we're doing this, we call factorial of three. Fact, factorial of three returns it returns what? It returns three. Return three times factorial of two. This one returns 2 times factorial of 1. What does factorial of 1 return? 1. So this returns 1. 1 times 2, this thing times 3, gives you 3 times 2 is 6, which, which gets returned from the original. And that's how you get the factorial of 3. Get, that, get how that works? OK, I know I'm going kind of fast, but I, I, I think you've all seen this before. Again, you could do this iteratively, in other words, with a for loop, pretty easily as well. It looks somewhat similar. You do have to keep a temp result, but it's really not that hard, right? If you're less than or equal to 1, still you return 1. Otherwise, you do this little loop that says go from n down to 1 and subtract 1 each time, and then just multiply by i each time. Right? The 1 less, 1 less, 1 less. That's all there is to it. Okay? So you can, you can go back and forth between these two if you want to. Generally speaking, this will probably be the better one for your program. This one's more beautiful, right? Because it's simpler. But you know, there's trade-offs here. Okay? Questions on any of that? Awesome. Fibonacci sequence. Now, who remembers what the Fibonacci sequence is so they can tell me what it is? Yeah, go ahead. Each number is the, did you say sum? The sum of the two numbers behind it. Yes. Now, you do need to kind of seed it with something, right? Well, hold on. Hold on. When we start out, right, 0 and 1 are the first two Fibonacci numbers. Okay? And then we can use your little algorithm, right? We can say the next one is the sum of these two, 1. The next one is the sum of these two, right? I'll do it this way, 2. The next one is the sum of these ones, which is 3. The next one, the sum of these ones, is 5, 8, et cetera. Okay? That's the Fibonacci sequence, for what it's worth. Okay, it shows up a lot in nature, I, I gather. Okay? When things are, uh, uh, yeah, it shows up, so, so it shows up a lot in fl flowers and the way they, their petals go and all that kind of stuff. I don't know enough biology to know the details of that, but, but that's the way it happens. Now, 
Take a look at how simple the Fibonacci sequence is recursively. Okay? If we've got kind of two base cases here, right? If n is 0, we return 0, because what we're saying is this is Fibonacci of 0, this is Fibonacci of 1, this is Fibonacci of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. Okay? That's how it actually that's how it works out in this case. Okay? What do you return? You return the Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci of n minus 2. That's if, the aren't, if you, these aren't these cases. OK, now, notice up here, exponential asymptotic complexity. Why is this exponential asymptotic complexity? What do you think? Yeah. This one function calls this itself two different times. This is our first real example of an exponential function. Let's just do, let's just do the Fibonacci of, let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3. Let's try the Fibonacci of 4 and see what happens. Okay, the answer should be 3. Okay? If we call Fibonacci of 4, okay, what's the algorithm tell us to do? It says return Fibonacci of 3 plus Fibonacci of 3 plus Fibonacci of 2. Right? That's what gets returned from that one. OK, what does Fibonacci of 3 say? Yeah. Yuki, what's Fibonacci of 3 say? Oh, you're sorry, you're pointing up here. What's Fibonacci of 3 say? What does it tell us to do? Yeah, it says, it says this one is going to return the Fibonacci of 2 plus the Fibonacci of 1. What's the Fibonacci of 2 say? Return the Fibonacci of 1 plus the Fibonacci of 0. OK, what's this Fibonacci of 2 say? Same thing, right? Fibonacci of 1 plus the Fibonacci of 0, and then Fibonacci of 1 will return what? 1. 1 plus Fibonacci of 0 returns 0, right? Fibonacci of 1 returns 1. Fibonacci of 1 returns 1 plus 0. And then if you keep doing this, you see how you've like exponentially expanded this? And by the way, this function calculates Fibonacci of 2 here and here. It calculates, fib calculates Fibonacci of 1 here and here and here. Right? And so it's terribly inefficient. Okay? You would never really want to do this. I think if you tried this on your computer, you'd get up to about Fibonacci of 20, and your computer would go, nope, no more. Right? It would be done. You might not even get that far, right? because this is an exponential asymptotic complexity. Be it would be, it's, a, it's a very nice recursive demonstration of how pretty this is, but you'd get killed if you tried to like, do this for real life, because right? it's exponential. And remember, we try to avoid those. Okay. All right. Well, what can we do about that? We can actually do this. We can create a what's called a helper function to do this. You guys have done helper functions in lots of different places in Comp 11, I know. But you can actually do this to get rid of the idea of doing uh, Fibonacci of some numbers. Now, the only thing that fib helper does is it makes it so that when I'm calling Fibonacci, I only have to call the number here. Right? This takes care of the rest of it. Basically, this one says, if, if n is 0, we're done. Don't bother calling the helper function. Otherwise, return the following. Fib helper n, 0, and 1. And notice, those are the two first Fibonacci numbers. They go into our, uh, they are our parameters p0 and p1 up here. Okay? And this case says if n equals 1, return p1. You could have had that down here, too. Otherwise, you could say return fib helper. Actually, no, you couldn't. Sorry, you do need a base case up here. Then you return fib helper of n minus 1, p1, and p0 plus p1. Let's walk through this one. Same sort of thing. Let's call Fibonacci of 4. Same thing as before. Okay? We said that Fibonacci of 4 should be 3. Fibonacci of 4, that's this one. What does that call? 
calls fib helper of what? This calls fib helper, I'll abbreviate, of 4 and then 0 and 1. Right? Many times when you have a helper function, you do seed it with, a, with an initial value like that. OK, fib helper 4, 0, 1. N is the first one. Is n equal to 1? No. So return this calls and then return, ret actually returns fib helper of n minus 1, which is 3, and then p1, which was which one? This one, so it's 1. And p0 plus p1, which was 0 plus 1. So far, so good. This, let's go all the way over here. We'll do it this way. Fib helper 311 is 3 equal to 1. No. So this calls fib helper of 2. And then p1, which was 1. And then p0 plus p1, which is 2. OK. Hmm. So far, so good. All right. And then this, this calls fib helper of 2, 1, 2. Is 2 equal to 1? No. So this one calls fib helper of 1. And then p1 is 2. And then 2 plus 1 is 3. Right? And let's see. This one says, OK, is n equal to 1? Yes, it is now, right? Fib helper is not a 1. So what do we return? We return p1, which is this one. So this returns 3, which got returned from this one, and returned from this one, and returned from this one, and returned from this one. And our answer is 3. See how that worked? You do not need to do this exponential branching for this. You use this helper function, and it goes and takes care of it for you. It has to be a little tricky. What we're basically doing is passing in more information into fib helper each time. We're saying, don't recalculate something you've already calculated. right? Just calculate based on the previous two values, which you can do right then. So it passes more information on, and it works pretty well. OK? Any questions on that, fib helper? OK. Another, another like, these are all like very basic examples of recursion, but each one like tells a story. OK? All right. I'm not going to go into this one too much. The greatest common divisor, or is it divisor? That's no, divisor, isn't it? I never know. Right? The greatest common divisor, you can do this in a couple different ways. Basically, you're, you're trying to find out what number divides in to both of those numbers evenly, okay? the greatest of those. Right? And what you can do is you can actually just do it, what we call a brute force method, which says, OK, if I have 28 and 59, just try the smallest one, because Nothing bigger than the smallest one is going to go into the smallest one, right, evenly. So try everybody down from that 28 all the way down to 1 until you get one that goes into both of them. That would be a brute force method. OK, you could do that. Okay. You could do that where you say, OK, just basically count down. I will let you look at this online. Timing-wise, we're not quite, not quite there yet. But basically it says, Look, and this is how we find the remainder, right? So basically, if the remainder is 0 for the first one and the remainder is the 0 for the second one, then you're done. OK, otherwise, you have to try the same two numbers with 1 minus your guess. And you first thing you pass in is the lowest number, right? So this will actually work. It's not quite as effective as it could be, although this would work, right? This is actually order n based on the smallest number. Okay. This would work, though. It is recursive. It would work. This part's recursive anyway, and it would work. What's interesting is Euclid, famous mathematician, came up with a much better idea. And again, I don't have time to go into this right now, but basically this is it. It basically says, look, if, we're, if we try to get the greatest common divisor of two different numbers and, and the second one is 0, we're going to return the first one. Otherwise, we call GCD on the second one and then the first one mod the second one. And it's actually very, very clever. It, it gets down to the greatest common divisor really quickly. Okay? Um, here's the algorithm. By the way, Euclid came up with this 2,300 years ago or so. 
right? Or 2,200 years ago, all right? And uh, it's a pretty old algorithm, okay? But again, it's recursive, and it's actually really clever. But I, I don't really have time right now to go through it, okay? But you can look online, see the details, okay? All right. One more recursion, then we'll go on to the other stuff. What's a palindrome? Do you know what a palindrome is? Yeah. Race car. Race car, OK. That's an example of a palindrome, right? R-A-C-E-C-A-R. -E In other words, said backwards or spelled backwards, it's exactly the same as spelled forwards. OK? That's a palindrome. You can actually figure out if a word or if a whole sentence or whatever is a palindrome using a relatively simple, uh, most of this is comments if, you'll, if you take a look at it, relatively simple um, recursion. Right? Basically, you say, if the, length is greater, if the length is less than 2, in other words, if I'm giving you a string with 0 characters or, or 1, isn't it by definition a palindrome? The word A is a palindrome because it's backwards and forwards the same. Okay? And then you basically check the first and last characters right? and say, look, if the first character and the last character are the same, just run the same thing on everything but the first and last character. It's a recursion, right? Recursion. You're going to run this. You're going to rerun the function checking this function, and then you're going to do the same thing for this one, and the same thing for this one, and then you're going to return true. And if it ever comes, the, it becomes the case that the the uh, letters do not match, you have to return false. Okay. See how that works? It's kind of a neat little recursion, right? OK, questions on this stuff? Questions on the whirlwind tour of recursion? No? OK, I will expect you guys to write some recursion, recursive functions on, uh, on the midterm, but it's not going to be hard stuff. It's just going to be very basic kind of do you remember how to write a recursive function? OK? All right. All right, and there's some advanced reading and some references that you can get there. Okay, let's look up the next one, which is new topic. Woohoo. Okay, maybe it'll open it for me. There we go. I bet it's going to crash. <laughs> Does not want to open this. Hang on. Let's try this again. There we go. All right. OK, so most of you guys raised your hand and said you've never seen this stuff before. Awesome. OK, brand new stuff. See this tree here? This is actually a real tree. This tree actually models a computer tree, or it should be the other way around. Computer tree kind of models this, this tree. We're going to talk about computer or computer science trees being this tree flipped upside down. Here's what I mean by that. We're going to have something that starts here and then branches off in various directions like this. You guys all have heard of a family tree before. It's the same kind of idea. You have two parents, and then they have a bunch of kids, and then all they have a bunch of kids, and they have a bunch of kids, and so on and so forth, right? Family trees are not always actual trees because, and I'll let you think of why this might be the case, there's some like, can be some weirdness going on. Go look at like the British lineage for like kings and queens and things, right? It gets a little weird in there. Right, because of some, some bizarre backwards and forwards like uh, cousins things and all that, right? But we're going to talk about, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, computer science trees, okay? And it's, uh, it's actually a very important topic because you will see this a lot during your, the rest of your computer science degree, uh, if you do that, or uh, any other like, kind of programming courses you take, okay? All right. Since we do a tip of the day, we'll do that. Uh, comments on late work. I think I already talked about that before anyway. And we're going to do an introduction to trees. And then n-ary trees and binary trees. And then we'll, if we get to it, we'll re-look re at sets. OK? All right. First things first. Oh, we've already done this. We know the CP command. And I, the SCP command is a command you use to to transfer files from your computer to, let's say, the homework server, or backwards and forwards. The, the command itself is exactly like the CP command. Basically, SCP stands for Secure File Copy. 
and you basically say SCP A, B, C, D copies everything from A, B, C into D. Okay? And how, does it, how do you actually tell it to go to like the homework server? Let's say you wanted to copy a file like SCP main, main dot CPP to the homework server. You type your username, in my case it would be C Greg, right? At homework.cs.tops.edu colon, and the colon is really important. If you forget that, it won't send it anywhere but your own hard drive. The colon, and then the, the directory name that you have in your folder system, right? Which might be something like desktop slash comp. 15 slash homework 3 or something like that. Okay? That's all it is. I know that looks really long, but that's all you have to do for a uh, secure copy. And it will take the file from your computer and copy it over to the other computer. If you want to do it the other way, this part would come first. The SCP, C Greg at homework, da 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 da, and then the name of the file, and then you could put main.cpp, which would be your local copy. Okay? Just another way to do it. If you don't want to use SCP, you can always use these programs that do it. Like CyberDuck's one of my favorites. Just because it's got a cool name and a cool icon. Uh, you can't really see it down there, but it's a cool little icon. OK. Uh, late work. Some people have not quite gotten this down yet. If I don't hear from you prior to a due date, you get a zero on an assignment. All I mean by that is please email me before, you, before the due date for an assignment if you think you're going to be late. And I don't mean by a few hours. I just mean like in general. If, you're, if you think you're going to be a few hours late, no worries at all. But if, you, if you're going to be like, two or th like a day late or two days late, just email me before that time so I don't go, where's your assignment? That's all. Okay? I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be mean about it at all. I just want to be like, clear about it. Okay? And uh, Friday nights, people are like, where are the TAs? Well, they're out having fun while you're working on your assignment. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Uh, questions on this? No? Okay. All right. Whose phone is that? Some... All right, so we have talked extensively already about this asymptotic complexity, right? And the only real ways that we have so far of accessing data is linearly, one after the other, OK? We do have a way to do binary searches, right, which was to jump to the middle of something and jump to the middle if it's an array. And that actually is very similar to what we're going to talk about today. Well. Maybe, maybe tomorrow, actually. Um, but we don't want to be limited to this linear access. Okay? Remember what I said about data structures in general. Give the structure information, and you can use that to do things faster. Okay? And the information here is going, to be is going to be the structure of this data structure. And it's, it's going to be this thing called a tree, which is going to have these kind of branches on it. Okay? And we're, our whole idea is let's break the problem down into, I wrote halves here, but it doesn't necessarily have to be halves. It can be, uh, it can be thirds or fourths or whatever. Breaking the problem into some number of pieces is really what we're trying to do. Okay? All right. We are going to look at trees, in the, and I haven't really defined them yet, but we're going to look at trees and how they can implement a file system. When you do an LS, your files and your directories make up a tree structure. Because you can go into a directory, and then into another directory, and then into another directory. And it's like breaking the problem into pieces, right? We'll also talk about how trees can evaluate arithmetic expressions, right? And what's nice about that is we did a little bit of this when we talked about stacks with the postfix behavior. Remember where we did that really briefly, where we said, if you have a postfix expression, you can use a stack to figure out what it is uh, it's a, the arithmetic is for that expression. We're going to do the same exact thing with, with trees. Okay? And then we're going to talk about how trees can provide fast searching, which is all about this idea of breaking the problem into half, 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 half again. Okay? I don't think we're going to get to this set class today, but um, we can, we, we will, we'll see. All right. Okay, so what is a tree? In computer science, a tree is a collection of nodes. Now, the nice thing is you have seen nodes before when we talked about linked lists. That's one of the main reasons we did linked list was to introduce you to a node-based structure. Okay? So a tree is a collection of nodes, which can be empty. You can have an empty tree with no nodes in it. 
right? But if it's not empty, there's this one node called the root. Okay? And this is why the original picture is kind of upside down from what we're doing. One node in a tree is called the root, and everything else emanates from the root. Okay? The root can have zero or more non-empty subtrees. So you can have a tree with a root and then subtrees coming off of that. I will show this to you in pictures in a second, and, and you'll, be, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay? And we connect the root to the subtrees by these things called edges from the root. Okay? It's a lot of words to say the following picture. Okay? A is, it's in red, you can't barely read it. A is the root. Okay? Notice this is like the upside down tree from before. Okay? A is the root, and all of these guys are subtrees coming off of the root. Okay? B is a subtree of one node. C is a subtree of one node. D is a subtree that has two in it. E is a subtree that has a whole bunch in it, four, et cetera, et cetera. Now, much like a lot of the other things we learned, there is a bit of terminology you have to know for trees. Let's go through some of that terminology. Yeah. Are you just copying? <laughs> okay, remember this is all online. So if you, do, if you do miss it, you can always download it and get the notes. Okay, so let's talk about some of the terminology here. We've got the root. Now, again, you, can't, you can barely even read this. I'll read it off to you because you can't see it. But um, you've got the root, and <sighs> computer science is full of analogies, right? So in, we're going to actually mix two analogies, which I hate to do, but they do this all the time in trees. Right? A is the root here, but anything that has as the previous node to it, and we're going to go previous is going up the tree, <clears throat> anything that has the node previous to it is going to be called a child. So that says B is a child of A. Okay? Because A has children. C, D, E, F, and G are also children of A. Right? P is a child of J, K is a child of F, etc. Okay? That's one, that's like the family tree kind of analogy. Okay? F is a child of A, and a parent of K, L, and M. So if you are the previous node to a bunch of nodes, you are called the parent of that node. That's a nice analogy, parent and child, right? So you've got F is the parent of K, L, and M. F is a child of A. Get the idea? Not too hard. Okay. Note something about these trees. There are n nodes and n minus 1 edges. And an edge is the line connecting them. Okay. Can somebody give me a one-liner why that's definitely the case? That's, that's pretty good. I might, I might say that's longer than one sentence, but that's all right. One liner, but that's good. Yes, basically, as you said, the, every node has a parent except the root. And it only has one parent. So for all the n nodes, everybody except the root has a parent. So therefore, there are n nodes and n minus 1 edges. Very good. Okay. All right, more terminology. Nodes with no children are called leaves, L-E-A-V-E-S. Sorry, they're red. I don't know why it was red. Okay. Nodes with no children are called leaves. These are leaves. Okay. This is going back to the tree analogy, like the biological tree analogy. Eh. So we're mixing analogies here a little bit, but that's what they're called. Okay. H is a leaf. K is a leaf. P is a leaf. All the red ones in this case are leaves. Okay. F is not a leaf because it has children. Okay? All right. Nodes with the same parent are called what? Siblings. siblings, just like the back to the family tree way, right? Siblets says siblings in dark red that you can't read. Nodes with the same parent are siblings, right? Because they have the same parent, just like if you have siblings, you have the same parent. Anybody, uh, who, how many people in here are the oldest child in their family? Yeah, how many people are like the middle or youngest, like down, down the rest, right? Middle or youngest children. Did you ever notice that your, your family probably has a million pictures of your older siblings and like none of you? Did you ever notice that? Yeah, that's the way it goes. I'm actually oldest, so there's my family. I go home and my sister gets, my younger sister gets really mad because she's like, Mom, there's no pictures of me in this entire house. 
And my mom's like, yeah, we kind of got sick of taking pictures after like, you know, after Chris was born. But anyway, so yeah, it always works out that way and it causes a lot of strife. Okay, so nodes of the same parent are called siblings. Pretty simple stuff. Okay, we can define a path. That's what this word is. Sorry, this is my pointer would work. That's what this word is, path. We can define a path from a parent to all of its children, right? And the path, and in fact, it's subchildren, which are actually, you can actually call them other things too. You could say that, you could say that J is a grandchild of A if you wanted to. We generally don't worry too much about that. You could say that, uh, you could say that E is a grandparent of P if you wanted to, but we generally don't worry too much about two levels down like that. But you can find a path between nodes, right? The path A, E, J, O, we can say how long it is. A to E to J to O is the number of edges connecting it. In other words, the number of hops it takes to go from A to, G, A to O. It, you would think it would be four, but it's not. It's actually three. The path length from A to O is one, two, three. Okay? That's how that one works. It's just the number of edges. Okay? All right. So we've got that. We've got the path and we've got the length, which is between a child and a, or a parent and its children and subchildren. Okay? You've also got the depth. The depth of a node is the length from the root to that node. Okay? So the depth of J, if you go up to A and you go down to J, it's 1, 2. Okay? The depth of the root is 0. It doesn't take any hops to go from the root to the root. So the depth of the root is 0. The height of a node is kind of the opposite, except you have to be a little careful. The height of a node is the longest path <coughs> excuse me, from the node to a leaf. There could be more than one. Okay, because you can have multiple children, right? So the height of node F is 1, because the longest path from the node to a leaf is 1. Okay? From E, what's the height of E? 1, 2. It's not 1. It could be. Like, you can get to a leaf with one jump, but the longest path is 1, is 1, 2. Okay? See how that works? That's the, that's the height of a node. The longest path from the node to the leaf. Okay? All leaves have a height of zero because there's nothing below them. There's no children. Okay? All right. And again, if you want to go back there and look at this and look at it, you can, you can figure it out. The height of an entire tree is the height of the root because the longest path to go to the bottom from the, height, from the tree is the, from the root is the height of that tree. Okay, in this case, the height is, let's see, one, two, whoops, sorry, one, two, three, right? Because the longest path takes three jumps to get to the farthest one away. Okay, that's considered the height of a tree. Height is going to become important when we talk about asymptotic complexity because uh, you're going to have to think about the overall height. Okay, because the worst case might be going all the way down to the lowest level. Okay, the farthest one away. All right, what does this say? It says nodes have ancestors and descendants. Back to the family tree again. <laughs> okay, E is an ancestor of P. <coughs> you won't see that too much. Okay, K is a descendant of F. K is also a descendant of A. Right? Okay. All right. That's, that, that's, that's about it for the basic terminology. Okay, yeah. Sorry? I see it drawn out. There's a technical definition that a path can be drawn from, I mean, that's up into a descendant. Oh, yeah. A path can be drawn from an ancestor to a descendant or vice versa. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's move on. How do we actually implement these things? And this is getting into the computer science part of it, right? We remember with a linked list, we had a node and we had, and each node had a a next pointer to the next node, right? So we could implement it this way. And I already said that trees are node-based structures, right? So we could have a node. Generally, we draw them with circles, actually, kind of like what I did before, right? But we could have a link to each child, 
OK, we could say inside this, um, this tree, there's a link, right? This is going to be like, uh, I don't know, child one and child two and child, child three, et cetera. There's definitely some issues with that, OK? Not really feasible because in a generic tree, the number of children can vary greatly. So if we set up and we said, OK, we're going to create 20 elements that all point to trees, that would limit us, or all point to children, that would limit us to only having 20 children per node. Now, is that normally use enough? Sometimes it is. Later we'll talk about this thing called a try, which is based on the letters of the alphabet, and you need at least 26. So 20 wouldn't even do it. But you could do it this way, but it's going to cause some issues. right? You don't know how many children necessarily you're going to have in advance. Right? Okay? It's probably true in real life too, I suppose. Right? Don't know how many children you're going to have in advance. So this is kind of an issue. We could do the following. Now, not many people teach it this way, and I'm only going to show you this like today, and you probably won't have to worry about it again. But one way we could do this is actually kind of clever. We could say, keep the children of each node in just a linked list. Right? So you would have your node, and then you'd have a linked list starting with one child, <coughs> and then that list says the rest of the children. And then those children could each have their own linked list of their children. Linked list of children, linked list of children. It's not a very symmetrical view of a tree. Right? Take a look at how we would do this. We could say tree node. We've got the element, whatever that element is. And then we could say the first child and then the next sibling. So you've got two pointers in here to your first child and then to your own next sibling. Right? So A, which is the root, would not have a next sibling because there's no siblings on, our, on the root. But it would have the first child as E. E would have its, next first, its first child be I and its next sibling be F. F would have its first, or its first child is K, and its next sibling is G. G's first child is N, and it doesn't have a next sibling. See how that works? It's inherently asymmetrical, which is why I don't love it. But it would work, right? We don't draw the null links on this. Downward is your first child, and sideways is your next sibling. Okay, this would actually work. This actually, believe it or not, models a file system pretty well, okay, which we'll talk about. Okay. Not widely used because it's kind of asymmetrical. If it was a file system, okay, let's say that A is your root file. So when you log on to the homework server, you do an ls and it says desktop and it says a bunch of other files in there, right? You are right now in, as far as you're concerned, basically the root of your own little tree. And it's a directory, it's not a file. Okay, it's a directory. And directories we're going to put a little asterisk next to. If you have inside the A directory, you have other directories like the desktop or comp15 or whatever, those could also be directories. And then let's say in the E directory you have a file I and you also have a directory J. Right? You see how this can model a file system? Okay? It's actually kind of, kind of clever in the sense of how we can do this. Right? And a lot of this can be done recursively. You can list the files recursively, right? And I'll show you how to do that in a second. And you can find the directory size recursively, and it's actually a nice, clever way of doing this. Again, it's somewhat asymmetrical, so it's not the best way, but it works. It means anybody, any directory can have any number of children or none, and those children could be either directories or files, which is exactly what a file system is. Here's how you would actually list them all. Now, this is a lot of code, boom, right like this, but not too bad. Basically, it's a recursive function, right? You've got a base case, which says if your node doesn't exist, if it's null, you return. Otherwise, if it's a directory, you go and you list all of your first child plus depth plus one, which is how far down you are, right? So A happens to be a directory. And so what you do is you call, you call list all again on your first child at a depth of 1. And the depth is there so that you can nicely space it when you print it out. You'll see in a minute when I show you this. Okay? Then you actually can say that you can have a temp node, which is your first child's next sibling, because you're going to need to print that too. 
okay? And then guess what? While you're temp no, while while you're not null, you're going to go through all the siblings, okay? And then you're going to uh, keep doing that. So it's it's a, a little bit weird of a recursive function, but it does the job. When you do this, watch what it prints out. Okay? It prints out the following: it prints out a, which has direct, which is the root, and there's nobody else on the same kind of. This is now a kind of a sideways view of it. A has in it one directory or two di three directories e, f, and g. So e, f, and g. E has a file i and a directory j. E has a file i and a directory j, and that directory j has a two files o and p. All right, and you see how this is a nice tabular way of doing this? Kind of clever. Okay, there's actually a program that will print your directory out like this. I'll show that to you tomorrow. Okay, and that's how you do the output of the file system. Okay, kind of neat when it works out. All right. So those were generic trees. We call them nary trees. In other words. It, you don't know how many children those types of trees have. File systems are exactly like that. Okay? We have a very special type of tree, which is what we will use for like 99% of your tree-based things. Well, maybe 80% because you've got these other ones we'll talk about later called tries. There's a special tree called a binary tree. And a binary tree is unique in that you're only allowed to have two children. What's nice about this is now we're not limited by we don't know how many children there are. Well, we know that there's either 0, 1, or 2. Okay? So a binary tree just looks like this. First of all, the node is easy. You've got the element, and you've got two pointers now. One is to the left, and one is to the right. Or I should say left and right. Okay? And uh, that's all there is to the node. And it's very simple, and it seems very much like a linked list, except now you can go in two different directions. Okay? Binary trees look like this. It's a very typical pattern, right? A has two children, B and C. B only has one child, D, right? D has no children, it's a leaf, right? C has two, E none, F none, etc. Okay, that's a binary tree. Okay? Binary trees are awesome because they're easy to deal with and they make things pretty darn efficient, as we'll see. The depth of a binary tree in general, is much less than the number of nodes. But it can be degenerate, which is like this. Let's say A only has a right child, B only has a right child, C only has a right child, and D only and has no children. What's this now look like? A linked list, right? This can degenerate into a linked list. Ah, we don't want that. Okay, so later we'll talk about how to avoid this kind of tree. Is that a tree? Sure, it's a tree. It's a tree where nobody has a left child. Is it an efficient tree? Probably not. Right? It, in this case, it looks a lot like a linked list. Okay? So we don't like that. If we can help it, we don't like that. Okay? If you have a generic binary tree and you haven't done something special to it, if you just randomly place nodes into a tree, you generally end up with the square root of n for its depth, right? which is not too bad. Right? That's not too bad. We can actually do better, as it turns out. But we want to avoid this kind of behavior. Okay? These degenerate trees can look like this. right? If you only have one associated child, you can also have a degenerate tree that looks like this. Right, left, right. right? That's still only one path down there. Right? And that one path is de a degenerate case, which we don't like it. Behave like linked lists. We don't like that. We want to avoid that. Okay? couple more pieces of terminology. A full binary tree means that every node other than the leaves has two children. You can't have a node except for a leaf that only has one child. Okay, so notice A has two children, B doesn't have any because it's a leaf, C has two children, and D and E are leaves. We're good to go. Okay, no single children. Contrast that to a complete binary tree. Now, I know the words full and complete sound alike and it's terrible and they never should have done this, but a complete binary tree means that every level except the last one is completely filled and all nodes are as far left as possible. What does that mean? It means the first node we have to put into this tree is A. Then we would have to put B in. 
Then we would have to put C in, because if you put D in, then A would not be, would not be uh, completely filled. Okay? So we have to go A, B, C, D, E, F is the next one. But if there's only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this is still considered a complete tree because it's in kind of the minimal form. Everybody's filled up except possibly the last level. Okay, and everybody's to the left. Okay, we will see these a number of times later in di for different data structures. Okay, complete binary trees. All right. Take a look at this picture for one second. Remember the stack that we talked about. Okay, this is modeling the same idea of operations that have two things that they operate on, two operands, but now we put it into a tree format. What this says in this case is, if you take a look at this asterisk right here, that means multiply b times c. And this plus says add a plus whatever this is. See how that works? And then this one says add this whole side to this whole side. In a postfix notation, this would be like this. It would be A, B, C times plus D, E. Don't worry about how you got that quite yet. Okay? But let's think about, let's think about actually, we will think about how we actually get this, this notation out of this. Okay? This is called postfix notation. Here's the algorithm for postfix notation. Okay? It's a recursive algorithm, and it says, Traverse left, then traverse right, then print the node you're at, then return. And this whole thing is a traverse. Okay? Let's, let's walk this through. Okay, let's walk this through. Starting at the root, okay, we traverse left, which means we call traverse on this one. What's the first thing we do in traverse? Traverse left, so we go down here. What's the first thing we do in traverse? Traverse left, but we can't. We're done, so we can't go left. Then what do we do? Traverse right, but we can't. We're in a leaf, so there's no right. Then what do we do? Print A, so we print, well, I'll do it right here. Print A. Okay, then we return. Re who called traverse left on this guy? Plus, so we go, we return back up to here. We just traversed left, so where do we traverse now? Right, what do we do with this one? Traverse left. This one we try to traverse left, try to traverse right, we can't, so we print B. Return. We just traversed left, so we traverse right. Can't traverse left, can't traverse right, print C. See that's going A, B, C? We go up here, didn't we just traverse right? So we print asterisk. Well, we can't do anything else, we just, we now return. We just went left, we just went right from here, we print this. We go up here. What's the next thing we? What, what's the only thing we've done from the root so far? Traverse left. So now we got to traverse right. Traverse right. Now we're here. Traverse left. Traverse left. Can't traverse or traverse left. Can't do left. Can't go. Can't go right. Print D. D. Return. Traverse right. Print E. See how we're walking through the whole thing? I will let you finish up the, that one. But this is called a post-order traversal because you're going to everybody and printing on the way back up. Okay? This is very similar to the count up method that we did recursively. Basically do everything and the last thing you're going to do before you return is print. Okay? There are lots of other ways to traverse a tree. You can traverse it in order, you can traverse it pre-order, and you can traverse it level order, which we will talk about all over the next couple of days. Okay? Questions on the beginning of trees or recursion? Okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Don't forget to come to class tomorrow. <laughs>